from me, but I want to start uh, by, by actually getting to something I'm very curious about, and that's the issue of miracles. I want to put to the side, and you in particular, Ian Hutchinson, who is arguing against the notion that science refutes God. What is a miracle if not a violation of the laws of physics? And, and is that what it is? Uh, in addition to all of its other implications? Does it not violate the laws of physics? And if it does so, how, how, does, how is that even possible? And how does that fit into this argument? So what we call the laws of physics, from a Christian point of view, are the way that God normally orders the universe. It's the normal uh, behavior of things round about us. And um, Boyle, who was one of the founders of the Royal Society, uh, wrote a whole book about what nature is. And, in, and what he advocated was that what we mean or should mean by nature is the normal course of events. Now, of course, miracles are not the normal course of events. And by the way, it didn't take science to tell us that. You know, people in the first century knew that people don't rise from the dead when they've been hung on crosses. And people knew that um, women don't uh, bear children unless well, you know what. Um, uh, you know, this is not something that modern science has been, a, has been necessary to, to tell us. So, yes, miracles are abnormal events, usually abnormal but why, events. Why does science not refute those things? As in, they it is seem simply, to be impossible. It's simply not the case that you have to presume that the, uni the, 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 the laws of nature are universally inviolable. It's simply not necessary to do science to do Lawrence that. Lawrence Krauss. Oh, well, that's ridiculous. Um, in fact, it's, it's ridiculous to the science that you do. When you do science, you're presuming that the results of an experiment in your laboratory apply in another laboratory. The, the, um, the fundamental claim that, that if you just... It, the miracles in your particular religion, it's kind of remarkable um, that these violations of the laws of nature only occurred before video cameras and Intelligence Squared and the Internet, and that you have these remarkable violations of the laws of nature in a book which I was really surprised to hear Dinesh call a scientific document, the Bible. Uh, I hope he really didn't mean that. St. Augustine would be very upset with you because he said the Bible wasn't scientific. But these, these uh, violations of the law of nature, laws of nature only occurred at a time when there was no evidence for them. But Lawrence, and you uh, believe it. Lawrence, but... But is there a logical argument against, that you can make against miracles? Not, not the I didn't see them and nobody has seen them lately argument, but is there a logical argument you can make them, against them? Our logic is determined by nature, not by what we'd like. And nature has told us that miracles don't happen. That's it. I don't, it's not what I want or what I think should be rational. It's do they happen, and there's no evidence that they've ever happened. Dinesh D'Souza. I, I think we have here a, a, a deep fallacy, and, and the fact that it's it remains a fallacy, shows that what is being called science is actually hiding behind a philosophical principle. Uh, it was the philosopher Hume who pointed out 200 years ago that from no amount of empirical generalizations, however large, can you draw a general law that is true as a matter of logic. What I mean is, it doesn't matter how often you measure something. Let's say you measure um, the speed at which this pen falls down. You can measure it a million times, but you don't know that on a star 10 light years away or in some other condition where you haven't measured it, that if you drop this pen, it will fall at the same speed. Science presumes it. It we, doesn't we, we prove it. it. Hang on, I'm let me sorry, finish. We measure it. Let me finish. Right, but you can't measure it always and everywhere, and you haven't measured it 10,000 years ago. You're assuming yes, that 10,000... No, you're assuming that 10,000 years ago, it happened at the same speed, and your measurement is based on that. So Hume's point is this. Science provides general propositions based on experience, but he said we should always be willing to accept new experience that, pro that proves the opposite. A, a good example of this in well, Western Dinesh, philosophy. Let, but, yeah, before that, you go to the example, let me let Michael Shermer come okay. in and, and respond to where you've gone so far sure. with that. Michael right, Shermer. so um, like a popular thing at Skeptic Magazine is psychics and people that can telekinetically move objects with their mind or so on. And there's an example of this where there's a man who can move the cursor on his computer just by thinking about it. Now, it turns out he's a quadriplegic and he has a chip in his brain uh, that enables him to do this. But if you don't know about the chip, it looks like a miracle. 
Once you know the technology, it's no longer miraculous. This is Arthur C. Clarke's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I contend that there's no such thing as the supernatural or the paranormal. There's just the natural, the normal, and the stuff we haven't explained yet. When something unusual like that happens, we should go searching for the mechanism behind it. Is there a chip in the brain? So if, it, if it's true that, say, God heals cancers or whatever due to prayer, this should be a measurable thing, because this is but what we what, do What, what about science. Dinesh's point that, that just because something has happened 10,000 times and that, that that's your case, that it's always going to happen, and he's saying logically, you don't actually know that it's always going to happen just because it's okay, happened 10,000 times. Science doesn't fine, say fine, that. Fine. In fact, that's very yeah. important. Science, I agree with you in that. Science can only prove what's wrong, not something that's absolutely true. So you're right. I could, I, I, I can't, if I drop a ball a million times and it falls, I, I in principle could imagine an experiment where it wouldn't, but that's highly likely it's going to fall the next time. But you use the key word, experience. We wait, then, for an experience that contradicts the known laws. So if tonight, when I looked up at the sky, the stars rearranged themselves and said, I am here in Aramaic or ancient Greek or whatever you want, then I might say, you know, there's something to it. But the point is there's been no, there's been no experience that violates the fact that the laws have Ian, existed well, throughout you, all Ian the Hutchinson. time. Lawrence, you haven't had such an experience, right. but there are probably people in this room who have. Um, so... I, the question fundamentally comes down to what counts as empirical? And in science, of course, what counts as empirical are things that we can do experiments on, we can do repeated observations. So science depends upon reproducibility. But if we were to reduce some phenomenon to a, re a reproducible behavior, we would have reduced it not into an explanation, a definition of what a miracle is, we would have reduced it into magic, or we would have reduced it into a new law of nature. So it's in the nature of miracle that it can't be reduced into scientific uh, form, and in the end, science becomes essentially powerless to say one way or another whether a miracle but can happen. If there was ever a miracle that happened, and tell me one that happened, that you can show happened. Let's let Michael show but, but even so, even if there was one, aren't you curious as a scientist how God performed the miracle, what forces of nature she used and so on to make it happen? Of course, and, uh, and so for example, so we would say as Christians, for example, that the Big Bang, the creation of the universe, was a miracle. Why was it a miracle? Because it used no known law of nature. It was, in a sense, supernatural. The, the and universe it, and is it, all, but that's it, just because you didn't understand it. But no, but you haven't, you haven't... See, here's the thing. When we talk about experiments and reproducible things, uh -huh. uh, you're talking, for example, let's take, for example, are there beings in, in, on other planets? Uh -huh. Right? It's an empirical question. Right in now... In principle, it's an empirical question, yeah. Empirical question. Right now, there is no evidence that there are creatures in outer space. Yes. Therefore, have you refuted that belief? No, but it's not an illogical one, like the notion that... Uh, that you haven't well, refuted it, it because, say, because you haven't refuted it because you haven't produced... It doesn't require me to suspend the laws of physics in order to believe it. But if I were to believe in, in creatures in outer space, I wouldn't be uh, irrational, no, but he's a, would I? No, no, but you've got to respond to the point he just made. It what does is not require a suspension of the laws of physics in order for you to believe there are creatures in outer space. Right, and I would say it doesn't and, require... And, and, but any, miracles do. Uh, no, miracles simply say that the laws of physics are incomplete, that the oh. laws of physics are generalizations that, that reflect the limits of human knowledge. These aren't nature's laws, they're Newton's laws, and it took an Einstein to modify them. So when the, when the, when the sun stress. stood, so these, these biblical scientists who thought that the sun went around the earth, uh, because that's what they thought when they were writing, when the sun stopped in the sky, of course, had the sun been going around the earth, that would be fine, but we now know that actually the earth goes around the sun, and the fact that the sun moves in the sky is the fact that the earth rotates. So had the sun stopped in the sky, the, the stopping of the rotation of the earth would have produced forces which would have destroyed all life on the planet. But that somehow doesn't violate the basic classical physics, that, and every now and then that's possible. Well, who are these biblical scientists you're well, talking the, about? You know, the blo horn blowing, the sun stopping. The people you know, who you... thought that the earth was the center of the universe and the sun went around it were Christians who, like non-Christians, were taught by scientists. That's where they got the idea. They weren't biblical scientists. They, they got it from you guys. I think what... But look, let me... I think I hear a serious question. I didn't mean it that way. I didn't mean it that way. I, I, I think I hear an interesting challenge. 
um, in, that, in that Lawrence is saying that if a miracle were to occur, that it has ripple effects in a broad, it doesn't just affect the people who are witnessing okay. the miracle. But if the, if, for example, if the earth stopped because the trumpets are blowing, on the other side of the earth, you know, some, some tribe doesn't know what's going on, but suddenly the earth has stopped for them yeah. too. How do they explain Look, that? In the 18th century, as science really got going, people thought that there were deterministic laws of physics and that once you understood the initial conditions, you could solve those laws and the result was absolutely determined. I think Lawrence will agree that what science has found out in the 20th century is that that is simply not true. That there is in the universe as a whole, as we discover it by science, some deep uncertainties, some undefined behavior, which in the end cannot be considered to be deterministic. In other words, a deterministic universe in which there's no room for God to, to operate is simply not the way we think about the universe as physicists these days. Michael Sherman. Let, let, let's say, uh, Ian, that petitionary prayer actually works. Again, as a physicist... Petitionary you, prayer, you mean, uh, I, yeah, I would like something to happen, and you for pray the, for the deity to, say, cure my cancer or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it happens. Wouldn't you be curious to know how the deity, or whatever it is, reaches into the world, stirs the particles, reconfigures the DNA so the cancer cells quit replicating so rapidly and so on? And the moment you figured that out as a scientist, it would no longer be a miracle. It wouldn't be supernatural. It would just be part of nature. It's like, so if I recant this prayer six times between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m., this is the effect. It's a measurable, determined thing. That's just now incorporated as part of science. Well, let's be clear that it's never been a, a religious position that if we have a natural explanation for something, that means that God is absent or that God didn't do it. It's always been a biblical viewpoint that even on things which we know are part of nature, God can be considered to be active in those things. So while, while this discussion of miracles is interesting in itself, one shouldn't be misled into, into thinking that the only place that God can act in the world is through those things which are so extraordinary that they uh, seem John, to be John, I just want to correct Lawrence an Cross error Cross that, I mean, I'm, I don't think you meant it, Ian, Lawrence so Cross. I want to just make it clear. The laws of physics are deterministic. The Schrodinger equation, which is the basis of quantum mechanics, is a second order differential equation. And therefore, the laws are deterministic our observations aren't deterministic, but the underlying laws are deterministic. Nothing's changed in, in, in 400 years. And so it's really well, important to recognize there's no way... Isn't the, the universe isn't, dis isn't deterministic. Wait a minute. Uh, I, it's governed I, by quantum mechanics. Just one thing, um, because we got into four syllables and I'm not that smart. Um, <laughs> Just give us a working definition yeah. of the word deterministic. You, you, you mean... You, you it, start it, it, with an initial condition for the equations of quantum mechanics, and the, and the evolution of the system is determined unambiguously. It has to no happen. no uncertainty. Your measurement of the system has uncertainty, but the evolution of the underlying uh, system know, is completely I'll, determined. I'll accept, I'll accept the slight correction, that, but the point nevertheless remains exactly the way I said it, which is that the universe is not deterministic. What science does is try to explain the universe by deterministic laws, by um, uh, looking at the world and trying to say how is it completely reproducible and, and in accordance with these universal laws. And what it finds out is that no matter how hard we try, we're actually unable to have a complete description of the universe of that type. And this was such a shock that even as great a scientist as Albert Einstein w was repelled by it. And, and he that's why wrong. he said, you know, God doesn't play dice with the world because he just could not abide it. But I would say, by and large, the majority of physicists today think that uh, Einstein was probably wrong and that actually there is inherent uh, Lawrence, one quick response. Then, then yeah, I guess what on. I want to say is it's not we don't have a go don't have a complete description. We do. Quantum mechanics, as far as we can tell, is a complete description. We have a complete description of the probabilities. We know with 100% accuracy, if you perform the experiments that was described in the paper uh, under your name, that with a distribution, the results will occur with, a different, uh, with that distribution exactly. And of course, because they did, you were able to write your paper. So to the side 